Thank you, Amy. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is day two of uh, Climate Museum's tour of Northern Ireland. Uh, yesterday we were in the Linen Hall in Belfast. Tomorrow we're in Armagh. So it's, uh, we're in Down Patrick, I'm told tonight, and I've even been <laughs> over to see St. Patrick's Grave. So what an amazing historical location to, to be in and to talk about, obviously, less of, of the past and more, perhaps, about the future. Um, I've worked on climate for a long time now, uh, 23 years I think I worked it out last night. I started working on the impacts of climate change back in the year 2000 when I first travelled to Alaska to see how the warming environment was uh, destroying permafrost and uh, causing coastal erosion and also impacts on the ecology. And that's the focus, I think, more for tonight. So last night we were talking, we had MLAs, we had the Belfast Climate Commission, we were talking about communities, we were talking about politics, we were talking about technology. It was actually quite an optimistic conversation. We were talking about the opportunities, the investment, the jobs, all of the new technologies and the opportunities for growth that are coming in the clean energy transition, which I think is now well underway. Um, but tonight we've got a different focus. We want to talk more about the, the natural world, and um, we've got three people here who are really experts and at the you know, cliff phase, you could say, not the cliff edge, um, of studying the impacts of uh, climate on, on conservation and on, uh, on other species who we share this planet with. Now, th what we're going to do is we're going to give each of them five minutes just to make an opening statement. Then we're going to have a conversation. We can open it up to your thoughts at any time as well. So please be prepared to chip in. Um, and we'll have a couple of microphones which enable you to do so in a way that everyone else can hear you. But um, so I'm going to ask you, Melina, to go up to the uh, go up to the lectern there and just just give us your, your opening five minutes. Yeah, Thank sure. You. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to be here. So my name is Melina Quinn, and I work for the National Trust. I'm the Nature Conservation Advisor for Northern Ireland. So I lead on our land and nature program. Um, and that's about looking after the, the land within our care. So in terms of climate change, the trust view, climate change is one of the, the single biggest threats to the landscapes, habitats and species within our care. In Northern Ireland, we look after just over 12,000 hectares of land and 108 miles of coastline. So our current strategy around managing land is we're wanting to manage land for nature, carbon and people. So we're keen to make our sites better, bigger and more joined. So what does that mean? So better looks at all of our existing carbon rich habitats. That covers our woodlands, our grasslands, our peatlands and more recently a recognition around coastal habitats. They're also capturing carbon which we refer to as blue carbon. So we're keen to look after, manage those sites as best we can, enhance and improve the condition as best we can. We're also keen to look at land that we have within our car that's not a prairie habitat. So we're keen to create more habitat or restore existing priority habitat and then find a way to connect these parcels of, of land, make them more connected and more joined through wildlife corridors and stepping stones. So we make our landscape more resilient for climate change and trying to allow nature to move between sites. Aside from site management, we also provide access obviously to a lot of people. Um, in Northern Ireland we don't have the right to roam like that exists across the water. So the Trust provides the opportunity for people to, to come visit these sites and to engage with nature. And we saw a big increase in people visiting our sites during lockdown. People discovering more was on the doorstep. So we're really keen to provide opportunities to increase awareness of nature, give people the chance to connect with nature, and then provide stories about what climate change is actually doing to our sites. Like for example, we look after Marlock Nature Reserve, which is quite, quite close. Um, and we just set up a new QR code which discusses shifting sands and salt marsh and blue carbon. So we have an opportunity to really engage in and share um, our understanding. We also are involved in advocacy. So that's really, I represent the trust in a number of different stakeholder groups. Um, there's a lot of things happening in the policy world at the minute in Northern Ireland. There's a new um, biodiversity strategy being consulted on. There's a peatland strategy. There's a blue carbon action plan. So I, myself and a colleague, represent the trust on those groups and we're really keen to advocate for nature-based solutions that align, align the habitats to help deliver um, more resilient climate. 
Um, and yeah, I can go through a few photographs we still on. But that's going to be enough. I haven't time this off. I'm hoping that's that <laughs> in around five minutes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I found. <laughs> We're not averse to the occasional round of applause. Um, Mark, sure. Take, give us, give us yours. Absolutely. So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Emerson. I am a professor of biodiversity at Queen's University Belfast. I'm based in the School of Biological Sciences and in the Institute for Global Food Security. I'm also the vice president of the British Ecological Society, which is the oldest ecological society in the world and it's Europe's largest. Um, I'm uh, the chair of an all-island Irish Ecological Association and also a co-chair of an all-island climate and biodiversity research network, which is a relatively new initiative, it brings together a mixture of natural and social scientists with engineers to address the, the joint crises of climate and biodiversity change. And that's very much in response to what I think many of us in the academic community recognise as essentially an existential crisis. We've got a, a, a mix of crises that we face in terms of biodiversity loss, in terms of climate change, in terms of food and water security. And the problem is we have this kind of nexus of problems, of, of crises that are all interlinked. If we can begin to think about addressing one, then we might be able to address them all. They're all highly correlated in terms of the types of drivers that will lead to declines and changes. If we think about biodiversity, there are a number of global drivers of environmental change that, that lead to declines in biodiversity. They include things like overexploitation of natural resources, it's invasive species and the impacts that they have when they get into an ecosystem, it's habitat loss and fragmentation, and of course there's climate change in the mix that will drive the way species are distributed across the surface of the earth. So over the last three years, I've been working with colleagues on an all island basis, bringing <coughs> engineers, social scientists, ecologists and, and natural scientists together to try and address those issues. And what we've done is placed solutions. I'd be optimistic that, 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 that we can begin to address some of these crises, that the, the future isn't entirely bleak. It's fraught with challenges, but we can try and address those. And so we've placed a mixture of solutions at the heart of what we're doing within that, that network. We're including things like technology-based solutions. So it's things like your aerobic digesters, your electric vehicles, hydrogen buses, your ground source heat pumps, all of which can reduce emissions to address climate change. We've got engineering-based solutions. So it's the built and physical environment. It's transport network design. It's, a, it's distribution and utility network designs and optimizing those so that we can optimize the arrangement of charging locations for electric vehicles, for instance. Then we've got societal solutions in the mixture. We've got uh, the need to design policies so that they don't have perverse outcomes. The RHI scheme is a prime example of a situation where you can get a perverse ac action and people find loopholes in the way that, that they might operate. But it's also about providing large organisations with the management levers that they can pull to effect change. And it's also about providing the just transition pathways when we're asking people who live on the land to make changes, how do we do that effectively and provide the solutions that they need so that they can maintain a livelihood while still living on the land. And then finally, we've got nature-based solutions, which is all about the, the natural capital of our ecosystems and looking at how we can understand the ecology of our ecosystems, how we can um, exploit that natural capital to address and mitigate the impacts of climate change that we face. So rewetting peatlands, it's about planting trees and the right trees in the right place and, and doing so in, in a way that promotes the growth of those trees, not just pine and then conifer everywhere. It's <coughs> the creation of salt marsh in low-lying agricultural areas that are, we know are going to flood because we're hardwired into a 37 centimetre sea level rise by 2050. It's uh, about effectively managing grasslands under agricultural production and figuring out how we lock up carbon in soils to effectively produce a carbon sink so that farmers are able to farm for carbon and nature, um, not just for food. And what does that look like? And how do we provide the regulatory frameworks um, for all of that to potentially happen. So I, I would be optimistic. We, we're kind of um, looking at trying to develop those solutions collaboratively across disciplines, 
At the start of the pandemic, we came together and have used our time wisely, developing green papers, taking that to government, to knock on doors, to try and influence political thinking, to influence policy. And I think we're beginning to, to have some traction there. So that's a kind of a sense, I would say that the future is optimistic. It's not without challenge. We are going to be faced with unprecedented transformation of, of, of the rural landscape, I genuinely think. Um, and in there, we need to find the solutions that are fair and just so that we can make those changes happen. Thank you. Uh, Simon. Hi again, everybody. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so, my name is Simon Gray. I work for Ulster Wildlife and um, local nature conservation charity here. And I specifically work on peatlands. Now, peatlands are a, a particularly um, high profile habitat in the context of climate change. Um, and they are arguably our most important habitat in that context because they're, they're a huge carbon store. So, um, they cover about 3% of the world's surface but they actually hold more carbon than all of the world's forests combined, um, which is a pretty significant statistic. And the island of Ireland actually has, as a percentage of its land mass, the, the fourth largest area of peatland for its area, for its land um, in the world, to be eaten by Indonesia, Finland, and Canada. Um, so it's a very, very important habitat here. And um, we have about 12% of our, our landscape in Northern Ireland, which is covered by blanket bog, raised bog or fens. This part of the world particularly is covered in lots of fens. Um, and my role within also my life is about trying to identify them, find out what condition they're in and restore them. So the key thing about um, peatlands is that when they're in bad condition, they actively work against us in a variety of different ways. So they actually impact our water quality, they, they can cause or, or make flooding more likely they emit CO2 whenever bare peat um, reacts with, with the atmosphere. But if they're in a good condition, they will actively work for us. So they will actually clean our water, they will actually prevent flooding, and they will, in time, sequester carbon. So one of the big elements of what we are doing is trying to map a lot of the peatland soils and the peatland habitats across Northern Ireland, particularly at the minute, and we're prioritising them, looking for where we can carry out restoration, what types of restoration we can do on those sites, what people we need to work with, farmers, landowners, statutory bodies like Forest Service, partners like the National Trust, sharing best practice and techniques to make sure that we get the best out of them. Um, but in the context of climate change, actually, there's another thing we need to think about, is that it's, it's time-bound, and that we're actually in a bit of a race here, because as we see ever-increasing extreme weather events, Peatlands, as a habitat, they like to be wet. And as you've seen, we've gone through periods over the past number of years in particular, where we've had prolonged periods where we've had very little rain. <clears throat> and so there's some parts of the country where actually given time and given the projections for climate change, we might not actually have to be able to um, uh, sustain peatlands. Um, so places like the Arch Peninsula, would have historically had huge areas of bog, which are now largely drained, but actually, given the rainfall projections, they might not be able to survive there ever again if climate change goes the way it's going. So there's a triage situation here where we're actively trying to see almost where the loss causes, where are the places that if we put in our effort and put in our funding and our time, can we actually save and can then help us try and combat the climate change, which is ultimately going to make the issues that are degrading them even worse. So it's a big struggle. And we have the peatland strategy which has been developed, as Melina has already mentioned, by the government at the minute. And to give you a bit of an idea of the scale of this, they're aiming to reach net, fifth, or sorry, net zero by 2050 in the context of degraded peatlands in Northern Ireland. We have to restore somewhere in the region about 7,500 hectares of degraded peatland per year. And to give you an idea of how big that is, the whole of the morns from about Newcastle stretching right across to Ross Trevor is somewhere in the region of maybe 10. So that's how much we potentially have to do over the next number of decades. So it's no mean feat. But they are arguably one of our greatest assets 
but we need to find a way that they can work for us rather than work it against us. So I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, well, thanks, thanks to all three of you. Um, I've struggled to remain optimistic. I try and be optimistic about climate. And I think in terms of the way that the humans have responded, it's been a slow process, but we're now at the stage probably where the projections for extreme climate warming are becoming less and less realistic, right? So I wrote a book called Six Degrees, and the last couple of chapters were about the very extreme amounts of warming that we could potentially see by the end of this century, which would be you know, unprecedented even on relatively long geological timescales. That's looking less and less likely. Um, the Chinese have pretty much stopped building coal-fired power stations, same in India. Um, we're probably at peak oil in terms of global consumption. It doesn't look like we'll be going over 100 million barrels a day, according to the IEA. So the long-term trend for, the, for fossil fuels is now down, even from where we sit today. And that should stay, allow us to stabilize the planet's temperature probably somewhere around 2 degrees, probably a little bit over. Uh, if we can accelerate our efforts, we might get closer to 1.5, which is, of course, the target that was agreed in 2015 at Paris. But the world's ecosystems, and I think humans will be okay in that scenario if we manage to do this. We can, we can adapt, we can change our agriculture, people can adapt, we can make fresh water through desalinization. There's lots of ways in which human societies can adapt. I think, I think it's a very different picture for ecology. Um, the rapidity of the change is outside the evolutionary experience, probably of most of the plants and animals that we're talking about. And they're already extremely stressed by human activities of all sorts, whether it's agriculture or exploitation or invasive species, diseases, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm chair of, I work in the Maldives a lot. I work with the former president of the Maldives. I'm chair of the Maldives, uh, I'm on the board of the Maldives Coral Institute. And one of the, that's probably one of the most stressed ecosystems worldwide. And it's incredibly depressing. It used to be great fun to go and snorkel in the coral reefs in the Maldives, and it's getting less and less so because you just see large expanses of rubble covered in algae. Uh, you know, there's still plenty of fish around, but the diversity of the ecosystems is declining all the time. And we're looking at ways that you can do emergency remediation. Is there any way you can speed up the evolution, try and get more heat-tolerant corals to establish? But, you know, it's going to be a drop in the ocean to coin a phrase compared to the diversity and the extent of reefs that historically have existed. So I think that's probably as bad as it gets. And even if we do stabilize temperatures below two degrees, we're going to lose 95% of the world's coral reefs. A whole global biome is going to be essentially extinguished in the wild. Um, so Mark, I'll come to you. Is there, is there any optimism in this scenario or do you really feel that we're in deep trouble when it comes to the way that the planet's ecosystems are being affected by climate change. Yeah, but I think you're right. There, there is an issue. We can begin to mitigate climate change uh, as a driver of biodiversity loss. But I mentioned earlier that there are a number of different drivers of biodiversity change, over-exploitation of natural resources. We've got pollution in terms of uh, chemicals that we put into the environment, use of pesticides for food production. But we also have uh, the nutrients that we put onto our ecosystems to grow food, and our ecosystems are leaky. You know, they, those nutrients run off into our fresh waters, and lake finds its way into the sea, and you know that, that has impacts in coastal environments. But it's also why in Northern Ireland we have no fresh waters, running waters that are on, on a five-point scale or above a three. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the kind of the st their status, we haven't, you know, that, that's, that's not a, a good indictment of the state of our natural environment. We've also got invasive species, and, and they are drivers of biodiversity loss and change. And we've got the way we behave towards nature. And I think, you know, no matter what we do um, in terms of mitigating climate change impacts, behavioural change in terms of mitigating the impacts by spreading invasive species, by over-exploitation, through pollution. These are things that, that also need to be addressed in terms of trying to limit the impacts on biodiversity. Now, there are a number of global initiatives, the National Global Biodiversity Framework, that emerged from 
COP15, and again, make the distinction between COP15 versus COP27. COP27, the conference of the parties, the 27th conference of the parties that was there to address climate change was held in December, November, December of last year. Um, and that has a, a series of regulatory frameworks to help uh, a global agreement on carbon emissions. Um, but COP15 is a process, a conference of the parties, the 15th conference of the parties focused on biodiversity change. And that was held in, um, again in, in late December um, uh, of last year. And there, uh, lots of the controversial uh, discussions were focused on trying to limit the other drivers of biodiversity change, not just climate. And, and that's where I think some of the big challenges lie. Now, one of the big drivers there that emerged was this idea of 30 by 30. It's the idea that by 2030, 30% of our land and sea area will have been given over to the conservation of nature. And that's a big global commitment that many countries have signed up to. Now, whether 30% of our land area is enough to put aside for nature um, at the expense of other activities that, um, that take place in the, in the natural environment, and you know, that's principally agriculture on, in an Irish context, whether that's enough to, to bend the curve, as they say, it, bending the curve of biodiversity loss, so pushing it back towards a positive trajectory, we're not going to recover species that have already been lost, but what we might be able to do is to push species populations away from small numbers, and that's where they become vulnerable to, to the extremes of climatic change. Mm. Um, and so it's about trying to restore <laughs> ecosystems as much as possible, given what we can do in terms of management interventions. You know, we, we don't manage ecosystems, we manage people in ecosystems and, and their impacts on the ecosystem. Now you can go into a peatland and, and put in, you know, start to put in block drains and do direct interventions, but what we're doing is we're, we're, we're actually going back and undoing some of the management interventions that people had put in place in the first instance. So it's about really understanding the decision-making processes of fisher folk, of farmers, um, and, and how they make choices to provide livelihoods for themselves. And, and that's not about being greedy, it's about generating an income um, and, and um, a viable income. So are there alternatives to, to food production? Do we think about car farming for carbon? Do we think about farming for nature? How would that work and what does it look like? Um, and how do we combine that with ambitions to put aside land and sea space or part of our landscapes and our seascapes for nature conservation? So I, I think that we can't, you, you can't, you can reverse climate change, you can't reverse the loss of a species. Once a species goes extinct, it's gone, you can't recover that. But we can begin to bend that curve to put species populations into a position where they are less vulnerable to, to chance loss. Mm. I think the 30 by 30 thing, the target that came from Montreal was interesting because it forces us to recognise that ecosystems need space first and foremost. And even though we can look around and you know it looks very green and whatnot, we actually live in a very ecologically impoverished environment. And Ireland's no different. In fact, to some extent it's worse. And often the places which are formally protected are the worst of all. Um, I can't speak for the uplands around here, but where I, where I am in Wales, it's all, you know, it's called the Cambrian Desert because it's all just sheep farming. There's, there's about two species of grass. You won't see any insects, you won't see any birds. And, and these are often inside national parks. Um, so I'm actually writing a report with Rewilding Britain at the moment to look at advocating rewilding as an approach, which is obviously not species specific. And as conservationists, you'll often be interested in, in specific species in specific locations where they're threatened or where they happen to be endemic or whatever. But I think it's, useful to put the focus back on ecosystems as a sort of something which is self a sort of self willed property of ecosystems that you can't micromanage these things. So from a tell me from a National Trust perspective, where are you on where are you on rewilding and the and you know and the, the, the idea of land land sparing for nature? I think rewilding is one of those words that can mean different things to different people. It can be quite a contentious word. And some people in one extreme it could mean, you know, taking livestock completely off off the land and going back very much back to basics but for us we're, we're really keen to promote conservation grazing as one of our key tools so when it comes to looking after protected sites so locally here we have you know a lot of land within Strangford Lock, Strangford Lock Islands, Murloc, Donard you know we're relying on local tenant farmers to graze those lands for us they're a key conservation tool you know we want to be able to graze sites so that we're 
removing the kind of woody species to enable the wildflowers to flourish. Um, and just when Mark talked about the agricultural landscape, a lot of our land is in this condition because government incentivizes us to do so. So post-war the focus was on let's produce food, let's become more secure in our food supply and that was the right thing to do at the time but that has inadvertently meant the loss of a lot of fantastic meadows, a lot of drainage of fields. So it's taken quite a while to get to this stage so it's going to take the same length of time to try and reverse that trend. So I think for us it's about looking after the core areas so within the trust land that's our protected sites they're the core areas that have the hot spots for, for biodiversity so if we look after those well they will provide the nucleus for restoration mm. and it's then trying to restore peatlands restore grasslands to try and lock up carbon as well as deliver for nature mm. so i think we need to work you know we're all we've all got a part to play in this you know we can't blame government we can't blame this that and the other it's about we all need to do our bit and for us it's about managing the land to the best of our ability, looking at making space for nature. The report which um, Professor John, Sir John Lawton produced back in 2010 looked at how nature reserves are not enough. Tradition the Gospel governments had done, let's draw lines around maps, this is, this is protected, this is protected. And there was very little movement between the sites, so that, that report is what we base our management on, is trying to make space for nature in every sense. So even if a site you know, is fairly degraded, there is scope to try and increase the diversity through maybe bringing in you know, seed from an adjacent mm. meadow. So for example, again, locally here, Castle Ward has a really fantastic meadow called Tully Rally. So it's a protected site, thriving with wildlife during the summer months, full of diversity. So now we can brush harvest seed from that site and put it in another site. So it's trying to provide those stepping stones. So I think we need to think of local solutions for increasing um, diversity. And you're right, you know, Ireland, north and south, is deemed a sort of a green and pleasant land, but it is very much a landscape devoid of nature. It's a lot of silage fields. And even if you are in a very intensive farming system, there, there are ways to try and improve the diversity of wildflowers. So, and that's where we're advocating with, with the new schemes for farmers is to try and find at least 10% potentially where you can allow some areas to, to become more wildfire rich to provide food for pollinators. And um, <coughs> that's bringing bogs. <laughs> um, I mean, they, the, the whole idea, issue of peatlands has really come, into, come to the fore in recent years, hasn't it? Because I don't think it was really appreciated just how much carbon was being released by degraded peatlands, mm -hmm. which historically in the, in the lowlands, like in the east of England, these have been the richest lands, so farmers have been encouraged to plough them up and they've, been, they've had the highest yields in terms of arable of uh, pretty much any, anywhere at all in the, in the UK. Um, raised bogs, uh, so not blanket upland bogs, but raised bogs have been exploited for peat for, for garden centres and stuff, and I presume all of that's now stopped. <laughs> Right? No, there's no, no longer any, any exploitation of, uh, of bog lands. You would but... love to think that, but unfortunately, no. So um, there is still quite a lot of exploit exploitation of um, particularly raised bogs for um, largely horticultural peat. They have just um, sort of stated that there's going to be a ban on the sale of peat within England and Wales. I notice today Scotland have moved towards, or are at least consulting on a ban on the sale of peat. We haven't seen any noises or any inkling of that here or down south. Um, I would say that's largely because there's a lot less to lose by moving on that sort of legislation in places like England and Wales, whereas here it is a bit of a different ballgame. There's more of an industry there that you're going to get a backlash from, and it's much more closely tied to the culture here mm -hmm. um, than it would the be. The whole culture of turf cutting and, yes. and all that. Well, so, no, and realistically, the, the, the culture of turf cutting on a, on a domestic scale yeah isn't anything that causes problems and on the scale that it currently well, so, so happens, can that be done sustainably it doesn't all need to end you, i mean if everybody now with the population that we have now did it hmm. it would be problematic but at the level that it is currently taking place in say particularly places in rural west of ireland it's not causing any problems it's the industrial scale activity which causes the problem yeah i mean in the south they have they have peak for power stations i mean it's extraordinary isn't it yes although board yeah. and Mono have stated that they're moving away from that now and they're right, actively right. looking at restoration Okay. Um, we now um, we're gonna. I'd love to. Yes, yes, yes. Totally, totally. Bring you in. Um, and I would love to be able to. Where's the microphones? Ah, 
Yeah. I didn't sort of say that a specific time, I, so very, very encouraging of you to come in whenever, whenever you'd like to. Is this on this specific peak topic? It is on topic. Fantastic. Um, please give the gentleman there. Right. Uh, the, um, I'm John Peacock. I represent the Cape Conservation, which has been in action in and around here locally, in the barony of the Cape, okay, um, for upwards of 10 years now. A question specific to harvesting of peat. And my experience, having been in the country for as a child for a long time, the scroll, which is a vegetation, is removed from the top of the bog, mm -hmm. and then deep drains are dug in the spongy peat, very quickly and easily you deep drains, get the water off it, and then you start to cut and you cut and you cut and you cut and you cut. Is it not possible to restore an area of cut bog by restoring the scroll on the top and getting the water level topped up? Is it not possible to re-establish the plants quite quickly and get the carbon absorbing again? Is it 100%, yeah, and it's been done now in quite a lot of different scenarios. We've done it on some scale in different places, and down south in the Midlands of Ireland, they are now doing it on an industrial scale. So Cornemona wants the, the major operator and extractor of, of industrial scale peat for power, for horticulture, for everything. They are now moving towards the industrial scale restoration of bogs. So those places where they've dug drains and they've milled it and they've taken away the top layer of that spongy peat, they are blocking those drains and actively trying to encourage vegetation to grow on that surface layer again. It's actually the second bit which is the more challenging thing. So usually in those cases the scroll which has been taken away, it's long gone. You what's, know, what's the scroll? The scroll is the top layer of vegetation. So that's the moss? The... Yeah, the moss or the, or the, 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 the grasses and the cotton grasses and, mm -hmm. and millennia and that sort of stuff. That's usually long gone in those sort of scenarios. In the scenarios where it's more domestic cutting, and you probably still have plenty of vegetation around, plenty of scroll left, then blocking the drains will do a lot to get that bog into a happier condition again. The key thing that you want for a peatland is the Goldilocks zone of the water table bin within um, 10 to 15 centimetres of the surface for 90% of the year. If it is not in that Goldilocks zone, it'll not be happy. So if it goes down for too long, can survive below that level for maybe a few weeks, but once it goes down f below that level for any extended period of time, then it's not good. Right. I mean, could, could jump in there. So, I mean, yes, you know, the, the key thing I think is with many of those bogs drained and, and dry, they're emitting carbon. And so, if we can get them rewetted, even if we're not able to restore that kind of living living surface in the short term, which might might take decades for that to come back on its own. Um, that at least we're stopping them emitting carbon and contributing and exacerbating the, the, the problem. Um, so it might, it might be decades, it might, for, for, for these systems to, to recover properly, and even when they do, the rates at which they lock up carbon are, are still going to be relatively slow. So, but, but it's the scale at which we have them that makes the difference. And, and I think that's something to just bear in mind, you know, that again, it's, there, there, is, a, there is a solution, but it, it's not going to be, it's not a, a panacea, there's no kind of panacea there at the moment. Mm, but we, you know, we need to be sequestering carbon in the ecosystems. And as far as I can tell, natural ecosystems is about the only way you can do it at the kind of scale which is required, which is, you know, we're at what, 420 parts per million now? Um, uh, everyone agrees a sort of sustainable level will be 400 or maybe 350 or something. So we already have billions of tonnes of additional CO2 in the atmosphere than the planet can afford to tolerate. I don't believe that industrial machines scrubbing carbon from the air and putting it underground are ever going to be operable at, at the kind of scale that we're talking about, of gigatons of removal. And of course, if you do it through natural ecosystems, it's being done through solar power using photosynthesis, which actually makes the most sense. At the same time, it's restoring ecology, which, it, which also needs to be done. So the whole idea of natural climate solutions as a sequestration tool Makes, makes a lot of sense, and, and bogs are probably only a small part of that. What, what are the biggest opportunities that you, you might see? I think there's, there's probably four, mm. and it's, it's bogs, peatlands, it's woodlands, the right kind of woodland in the right kind of place, not conifers everywhere. Um, it's salt marshes, and you know, again, uh, we're going to see changes in our coastal environments, and there's an opportunity there to promote the growth of salt marsh notwithstanding invasive species that you get in salt marshes too, um, but they're, they're, they are huge carbon sinks. 
and then it's grasslands um, in an agricultural context, and, and not just agriculture, but managing them effectively. And, and I, I think there are there are some interesting developments there in terms of not just managing grasslands for monocultures, but shifting towards multi-species sports. So this is where you, you take a mixture of grass, of herbs, and of legumes, and you sow them, sow them together with a, a mixture of anywhere between six and 18 species. Um, and you know, if, mm -hmm. if there were a mechanism through agri-environmental schemes that got 30% of our monocultures replaced with multi-species swords, that could have really beneficial effects, um, both in terms of the resilience of those swords in the face of climatic impacts. Um, we see things like the fodder crises happening on an all-island basis, where we end up with very dry summers that leads to a low fodder production during the spring and summer, a wet, wet, wet autumn, and that means going into the, the, the summer for farmers with a low silage reserve, keeping cattle in housing over the winter, and then having a cold winter in combination with all those other effects, and it means you, you start to run out of fodder for your housed li uh, livestock. And that's a big issue. So a multi-species sward can provide a more, maybe lower, lower levels of productivity, um, perhaps, um, but there's lots of evidence to show that you increase the biodiversity of a sward, you'll increase its productivity too. So you can increase the product, possibly increase the productivity, increase the resilience to drought, um, increase the resilience to standing water. Um, so you, you can sort of shift the system to a more resilient production system and you increase biodiversity that creates lots of habitat structure in the sward, that creates the home for insects, um, invertebrates, that are food for all sorts of other um, parts of the ecosystem. Um, mm. Bats, birds, rodents, uh, mammals. So that there's a po general positive effect. Now it's not getting the landscape to 30% given over to nature, but if you could shift 30% of the grassland swards to a more diverse form of agricultural production, that's, that's a kind of, I would say, that's a, that's a positive, positive effect that, that could permeate through the system. Can I just Please do, sort of yeah. back that up? So in terms of the multi-species swards, we have trialled that over the last few years. So we have um, sown this mix, as, as Mark has described, adjacent to the Giants Causeway, Dunseverick, and then more locally at Mount Stewart. And exactly what Mark has said, you know, it's a sort of up to 20 species of different grasses, um, flowering plants and legumes. So the fact that you've got nitrogen fixing plants, your beans and peas, you don't need to add fertilizers. So obviously with the rise in fertilizer costs, that's something that farmers are really keen to, to promote. Um, and also given the depths of the roots of these grasses, you know, that goes from a few inches down to a metre and a half. We actually promoted this system at Balmard Show last summer and we had the root of chicory, which was a metre and a half. So that really helps um, in terms of improving soil health. So if you've had a heavily compacted soil, you know, heavy machinery for the lifetime of that field, introducing this forward really improves soil biodiversity, improves infiltration rates. So if there is heavy rainfall, there's more capacity for that soil to hold water. It also prevents runoff then, so at Mount Stewart, for example, it's producing less runoff going into Strangford Lock, you know, so you're improving water quality. And also, as Mark says, it, it attracts pollinators, so if you've got a good invertebrate life that attracts your farmland birds and higher, higher species. And I was actually at Mount Stewart that summer, we had that Ireland, North Ireland had its first ever amber heat warning back in mm -hmm. 21, I think. Mm. So I was actually at Mount Stewart that week. And the field of herbal aids was still going strong, really green, full of life. And the fields around it were all completely, you know, burnt off, you know, brown. The roots were too short to tap into any water. So for me, that was like, wow, this, this, this works. And, you know, we have, you know, the farmers that manage that land for us. And they see the benefits. So they're then advocating that to their peers. So I guess that's where the NGO sector can come in. We can demonstrate this on-site, show that it works, and then advocate for the same with, with government. And I think a 30% would be a great way if we're able to look at this 20, 30 by 30 by 2030. Um, a 30% of our very intensive silage fields can go this route. That would be a big win. And it also obviously improves the, the there's test trials, so it actually improves the quality of the meat. So you're getting a high quality product from your, your, your beef industry as well. Mm -hmm. I, th I think one of the things that, that we, every, a lot of people yeah. are in agreement with are that 
we know a lot of the solutions. Mm. The challenge isn't isn't working and knowing what the solutions are. It's actually finding the mechanisms whereby you can deliver them. Mm -hmm. How you actually get people to enact them and put them into practice. I, um, I think you've, you've partially answered what I was going to ask. <laughs> In that, um, I, I don't, I'm a retired mechanical engineer, so I've been involved in making up this book, electricity, um, over the years, uh, from, from virtually every source, um, including wind in the last, last number of years. So I'm, I'm aware of a lot of the ecological stuff from developing wind farms, because you have to understand where, you, where you're going. But the, the, my question would be, again, it's probably because of my engineering background, in practical terms, it's how you get engagement from the landowners, the farmers, the people that are actually out there. Um, yes, you've got a captive audience tonight, people are interested, but there's a, a very encouraged to hear that um, the examples that the National Trust farmers uh, are spreading up locally, but how do we engage on a regional or a national basis? And the big, the big, um, well, the big body behind us all is the, the whole dislocation of uh, a lot of scientific interest and sort of efforts because of Brexit. Because the UK is going backwards, it seems to be, in terms of engagement um, with the people in, in Europe and the rest of the world. But locally, it's how do we engage with our farmers and their organisations to roll these schemes out? That's 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 really where, where I come from in a practical sense. Yeah, I can take that, you know, just from, from our point of view. Um, a lot of our tenants that we so we have 80 different farmers that operate across our sites in Northern Ireland and quite a few of them are now in the Nature Friendly Farming Network. So that's a really progressive group of farmers that are really keen to trial herbal eggs, have done it on their own, own farm and they are reaping the benefits of it and they're really keen to sort of sell that high-end product to local restaurants so they see there's a niche market there. So it has a really strong voice and like they've, they've taken their campaign to Westminster. They're quite, they're small but they're very vocal and they're a very powerful group. Um, Ulster Farmers Union are looking at this and hopefully we can crack, that's a big nut to crack essentially in trying to get the bigger lobby that are supporting essentially the, the intensive farming and the dairy industry to embrace this as well. So I think advocacy is, is the key role that the sector can play. Um, think, yeah. Do you mind if we just take, yeah, come back to you and the gentleman that's been waiting a while. So. Um, I would like to ask the panel for some personal advice. I'm not a farmer, I'm a retired doctor, I have a small garden, I have a diesel car. So I think I can make some changes. I can change my car to an electric one, although I have some reservations about uh, the ecological benefits of electric cars. I can reduce the use of plastics, I can reduce my water consumption, I can take some of these small changes. But they feel like an infinitesimally small effect for me as an individual. What can the panel advise me as an individual to do? What can, what can you tell me that I can do that will actually make a change? Can I take that? Yes, I th please. I think one of the big problems that we face is that people, people want to see an immediate effect. The reality of the matter is that most of the things that I would ever advocate doing will probably <coughs> feel like an infinitesimal change to you. But the challenge is that whenever you have lots of individual actions, they add up to a great one. So we look at this conversely, um, from the impact of, say, something like footfall on habitats. If I was to walk over a, a stretch of peatland once, it'll probably not make any difference. If I was to do that continuously every day, it would start to make a real big difference. If 50 people did it every day, it would start to make a humongous difference. So it's... It's a challenge to come up with that silver bullet that you yourself will do that is going to make a massive change. But if I was going to think of things that I would recommend, food is by far and away one of the biggest things that I think people can make an individual impact on. So definitely thinking about where it's coming from, whether or not it's coming from further afield or <coughs> the kind of intensity of agriculture that it's used to produce it. That is something where I would make a big start in. I've tried to do that and it is a challenge. Um, it can have impacts in terms of cost, how much food is going to cost, but also challenges in terms of where you get it from. But trying to buy things that are locally produced, and a lot of the stuff which is done by the National Trust Farmers would be great examples of the sort of 
food and produce, that would make a big change. Because actually then what we could do is we could try and shift the market more towards wanting that kind of produce rather than the kind of produce that comes from much more intensive agriculture. I mean, I'm afraid we have to eat less meat as well. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. the, the food mile is actually a relatively small proportion of the overall impact of, of diets, uh, meat and livestock. And unless, Mark, did you want to... No, I, I was going to make exactly the same okay. point. I think, I think that, you know, yeah, look at where your food is produced, but actually the carbon footprint that comes from distribution of food is low. Unfortunately, you know, it's the emissions from livestock that, that are the big challenge. And there are, there are developments in technologies in terms of food additives that can be um, put in place to try and mitigate that. Consumer choice in terms of not, not ruling food out of meat out of the diet, but reducing it and, and going to a more plant-based diet, I think is probably one of the big areas that we, societally, that we can make. A, now, that's not something that necessarily is good for farmers, but, you know, then how do we... How do we look for alternative forms of livelihood that farmers can sustain an income from? And that might mean farming for nature, farming for carbon, and, and I'm trying to understand how that works. And there's a, there are policy incentives, so there's the stuff we can do individually, and I, I agree, it's lots of, small, lots of small actions add up to make a big effect. You know. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, and you, you please, and then afterwards, can we have a question from a woman? I need to try and keep things gender balanced. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to ask a question after Oh, that'll be amazing. Thank you. I'll make a point first. Please, actually, yeah. Just related to your marketing for the last point. Just speak straight to the top this one. Yeah. That last year, AFB was consulting on the Romania strategy for Northern Ireland. I went along to, along to an event and asked them had they modelled reducing animal numbers and the impact that would have. And they haven't, and they haven't. So it was all about the technical solutions that they would impose. So I think it's back into that cultural and behavioural attitude in Northern Ireland that... So I'm not convinced that we're, we know what the solutions are, but I'm not convinced that the political level, even though we have the Climate Change Act, that our politicians and industry leaders and farming unions are really committed or serious. And that's... And given the scale of the problem, if it's post-war, 70 years to get us to this stage, all of the brilliant things that are happening are still so niche. Are we really going to get the change that's needed? That sounds very negative. It is a very good point. The, the ammonia strategy, which is out in consultation at the minute, is, it is glaringly obvious that the, the notion about reducing herd numbers is being largely avoided. And we're going through a lot of effort to come up with solutions which get round addressing that issue. <laughs> um, because there is still such a strong push for production. And a lot of the, the policy that has been pushed from the agricultural side um, over recent years has, has effectively tried to maintain the status quo of growth and produce. Um, while trying to come up with very hard engineering and technical solutions to stop the environmental impacts of that while maintaining the growth. And realistically, it is very hard, very expensive, when the more straightforward option would be to reduce her. It's a huge issue for rivers as well, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, huh. I live near the River Wye in Wales, and we've got poultry sheds all over the place, um, huge amounts of phosphates and, and nitrates, which have basically destroyed the river's ecosystem in just the last few years. Yeah. The salmon have stopped coming, you know, all of the, the, the reed beds, everything's gone. And it seems to be an untouchable issue because the, the farming lobby is so powerful, has such a powerful voice still. And Ireland, Ireland will never get to net zero without addressing the livestock sector. Um, and that's something which needs to be, I think, probably discussed a bit more explicitly than it is at the moment. But I'd like to hear from either of you about that. I, I agree. I mean, I think AFB are never going to advocate for a reduction in the, the national herd. And they're not going to call for a car, are they? Um, I, you know, we, we're working on a, on a uh, the proposal for a new all-island cl climate um, centre at the moment that spans both north, south and east, west into GB. And we've been engaging with lots of different sectors and industry partners, including... Nature Friendly Farming Network, we met them this, just this week. Um, so, I mean, what we're trying to do is to meet this head on 
um, and try and find the solutions that will work for, for farmers and the way we transform the landscape. You know, a conversation with Dow Farm, for instance, they know that they have to reduce emissions from the livestock sector by 48% in just seven years. That's part of our climate act. Mm. So they've got to shift the sector. And there was a, the gentleman here asked, how, how are you going to make these large scale changes? And, you know, Dow Farm, they have a, a dairy cooperative that have 1,250 farmers broadly on their books. So that there is a large scale management organization that can provide an incentive for farmers to make those changes. And that's not mm. to say they're going to use a stick, but they will use financial incentives to enable in, in, interventions and change that, that can happen at scale. And they know they've got to do it quickly because they want to avoid a cull of the herd. Mm. Um, and, and they, as a, as a business, need to maintain a viable business. And, and, and can't the National Trust, I mean, you're, you're actual landowners, right? So you have, you can boss your tenant farmers around a bit. I mean, can you not take a stronger line in terms of this issue, at least? We are trying to, to sort of, when it comes to our ambition, we're trying to go down the more native breeds as opposed to heavier sort of dairy cattle because it's those that mm. need to house. So in terms of stocking rates, are you actually looking at reducing livestock overall? Well, it depends. It's specific to the habitat. You know, we're, we're really keen. We, we operate within like sort of the countryside management grazing prescriptions. So you, you, know, you graze lightly all year round or you only graze during the winter months or vice versa. Um, but ammonia is a massive issue and a lot of the sites that the Trust look after, you know, the ammonia levels exceed what you would call the critical load, which is mm. very concerning. So we'll be putting in a strong case and we've started to monitor ammonia on a few of our sites because at the minute you're re relying on models which give you the ammonia output as opposed to actual site data. So we have three sites that we're starting to monitor for ammonia and I know Ulster Wildlife have in the past. So we're trying to kind of gather the evidence of what the impact is on our sites. Yeah. Because it is, it's sort of one of those sort of silent sort of issues and not only does it impact on protected sites but the whole countryside. So essentially what it's doing is it's, it's adding fertiliser to a range of semi-natural habitats, creating a real growth of grass, and which is like competing our native wildflowers. So it's not good, it's not a, an issue specific to protected sites, it's, it's very much an issue across all of Northern Ireland's. Yeah, and I, know, unfortunately. and I know we're meant to be talking about climate, but all these issues are interlinked, so I don't feel the least bit guilty. Um, <laughs> the lady there, please. Uh, Sally Montgomery. Um, uh, you've talked about agriculture in terms of a financial model. There's obviously another model that you are all heavily, well, perhaps not Mark, but heavily invested in, which is tourism. And um, one thing that COVID showed us was that people buy, you now understand the value of green spaces. But that's put an enormous pressure on our outdoor spaces, in particular the norms, uh, which has seen um, numbers, they climbed during COVID, and they really haven't dropped any. And yet, um, what happens then is that there is perhaps the need to capitalise on these wonderful outdoor green spaces, not necessarily look after them and manage them, but um, maybe um, build uh, tourism uh, structures. Exploit them. <laughs> Exploit them. <laughs> and, and how do we change this model of thinking rather, rather than exploiting, um, but investing in them? Is the Mons National Trust? Well, partially, not yeah. very much. It's primarily common, common ground. See, common, commons is a, real, a really difficult management issue, isn't it? Yeah. Because who decides? It tends to be the graziers who decide on the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the management of the land, right? How do, you, how do you look at that from a box perspective and then I'll come on to the wider... One of the, one of the things that I was thinking about whenever you were asking... Peatland, the question, sorry, not box. Um, oh, they're all... <laughs> um, it, one, of, one of the issues that we have here, which is, is specific to our part of the world, is that we have really poor access to our countryside. And actually, one of the, the, the symptoms or one of the outcomes of that for somewhere particularly like the Moorns you have a large area which is largely publicly owned land by Northern Island Water in the Mornings, which is quite unique. Um, and there is a lot of access paths that have been trodden there over the years. Now it is very scenic, obviously. But because it's one of the few areas in this country where you do actually have a capability of going for a walk in a wide open space legally, then loads of people have done it. If you go to somewhere which is very, very scenic, like the Sperrins, the number of legal access routes that you have in that part of the world are minuscule. So what's happened is that we have got effectively these honeypot areas 
because we have so few opportunities, people have all gone to the same place. And therefore, then, you've got an increased pressure there in terms of exploitation. Whereas if that impact was potentially more widely spread, at each individual location, it might not be quite as bad. But recreational pressure on peatlands is, is huge. And I think that that's actually one of the, lead, the, the biggest issues. I used to work on coca down in Fermanagh, which is probably the best case study of the negative impacts of, of opening up recreation into a sensitive peatland environment. And so what happens? Be, be specific. I'm kind of curious. well. Sphagnum. Put it this way: Sphagnum moss, which is the key building block of, of peatlands of bogs, is not particularly well suited to being trodden on. Mm -hmm. um, so it, repeated trampling on it will usually lead to bare earth being exposed. It's wet. It's soggy. Then whenever you get a line of soggy wet ground, people then go on the dry ground to the mm -hmm. side, and before you know it, thirty years later, then you've got a path or a scar which is fifty meters wide. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that it is a big issue, but actually I think if we were allowed to improve our access to our countryside in this country, it would go a long way to making that slightly better. You could make boardwalks and things. I mean, there are also... No, 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 no. <laughs> What can you do? Other, other, other than stop people going, what can you do? I mean, it, you, you can provide more sustainable access, but there is an ethos thing here. So I, I went to Iceland not that long ago, and there's a much different culture there to the sustainable access to the countryside than there is in this part of the world. So they have a real awareness there of how sensitive their landscape is to, say, recreational pressure. They even had a ridiculous YouTube video about the sensitivity of moss, people singing about moss, um, which is a great watch if you can find it on YouTube. Um, but here we, we, we don't, we see it more as like, um, you know, the environment is almost like a byproduct of, of us wanting to go out into the countryside in a lot of instances. You know, a lot of people that will go walking will see that they, they, have, they have an end destination they want to get to, a photograph they want to take, and everything that they've gone through is just almost like a, you know, it's by the wayside. They maybe even haven't paid attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an education there that needs to be done in order to try and you know, get that across to people. And we'll come back to you. There's, there's a lady here. Um, can you, can, can we get you, we'll, yeah, hold on a second, we'll get you the microphone. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's not <all> constructed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 it's, the problem is when you have public access to places, people don't take their garbage with them. I mean, mm. you, anywhere, even along the motorway, the other, not so very long ago when I was going to my sister's, about 200 yards past the apple green, the sidewalk, or the footpath, or whatever you like to call it, was full of takeaway cartons. So it was to prevent the people who were eating that stuff taking the cartons home and putting them in the bin. That's a fair issue. Come on. Throw them that. Throw them yeah. to the backside. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure, believe me, you have plenty to talk about are rubbish. Farmers. <laughs> I don't trust that. Because we're farmers. Mm -hmm. And they spent their time going along the hedgerows to pick up broken bottles, jaggedy cans, etc., so that the sheep, the cows, the chickens, and everything else didn't get hurt. There's enough necessary even to try and make the general public be a little bit more aware and a little bit more careful if you take your garbage with you. When so it look, comes to walking on somebody yes. else's land. Thank you. No, we, we take your point. Well, how, how much of an issue is that in comparison to some of the I mean, microplastics, so it is. I mean, microplastics. I mean, microplastics in terms of the way, you know, the, the plastics don't decompose, but they do break up mm. and, and they can end up in our soils, in our water courses, and, and that's, that's an issue. Um, but I take your point, you know, I, I walk the country lanes around where I live and frequently take a bin bag with me and pick up plastic bottles, cigarette packets, drink cans that are routinely thrown out and you know so there are I, I suspect it's it's the same drink can lots of times um i suspect it's a serial offender who's chucking stuff out <laughs> of the window as they drive uh, around but i think the national trust have had issues even during the pandemic of you know hot, hot weekends and the the green spaces in city centers being completely decimated with rubbish so and the cleanup yeah, operations yeah, yeah. having to kind of go in and there's a significant cost so how, how do you manage access i mean it's a very depressing picture, and your, your point's so well made. You know, a lot of our rangers get involved in conservation because they want to be out on the ground doing really good conservation work. And then there's weeks during the summer they spend their time litter picking, so it's really disheartening. 
So like we promote the leave no trace message. Um, we try to promote people, you know, keep their dogs on a lead, particularly with ground nests and birds on upland sites along the coast. So it's really trying to promote that message, but I think it's about behavioural change as well. And I know even there's a new, a fairly new campaign at the minute in terms of collecting litter from your, you know, your dog poop. Is there's a new mm -hmm. hard hitting campaign and you're getting fined eighty pound. But you know that's that's the the deterrent. So it's it's, it's sadly it's sort of some elements of our society just don't appreciate the need to clean up mm -hmm. after themselves. And how we crack that is a big yeah, challenge. They say there's uh, litter laws, but. I mean, even my garden, I'm finding yeah. cans and polystyrene. Yeah. I mean, it speaks to Sally's point with, with, that she made earlier. Like, how, how do you shift society to place more value on the natural world around us and invest in it rather than simply see it as something that's there? There's, there's for us a to book exploit. by two American academics called Cass Sunstein and Richard Taylor, and the book is called Nudge. And the theory is that by making incremental changes in legislation, you nudge people, you push people mm. into changing their behavior. You go into the schools, you teach civics, as it used to be called, whatever you want to call it now, I don't know, but you teach the children this. You go back and you encourage the parents. You make these changes in the laws. The litter laws are one of the things, they're not enforced, or very rarely, mm. But we can change behavior by making, you know, the carrot and the stick. It doesn't have to be a very big stick sometimes to get people to make <coughs> those little changes. Well, look at the plastic bags. Uh -huh. it cost. Can we, can we get the... Stick? Yes. Yeah. And then, then, then if, is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet, please get ready because okay. we're, okay. Having to, we're going to have to come to an end quite I'll soon. Give, so. I'll give yes. a good example of nudging. Hmm. Thanks, thank you, Gilbert. Port of Ferry, which is seaside resort, did a festival a couple of years back and it was massive. It was right on the holiday season and you couldn't get parked and you couldn't get sat on the sea wall. And there wasn't, there wasn't room to budge, the litter bins were overflowing. However, there were gangs of youngsters with blue bags and pick me up sticks. And they set a good example, they got the job done. I'm thinking if litter the value of litter has a negative value, which, which can be huge, and it has a positive value of a few pennies for a bottle or a tin. Therefore, can we arrange that vagrants, children, whatever people, could properly spend a day filling a couple of big bags for the price of a coffee and a sandwich? Or with health and safety and the need for professional qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> and insurance. Uh, yeah. yeah, public liability insurance probably for the coverage. Uh, and, uh, the issue is that yeah. all, of the, all of the things that people have spoken about here are mm -hmm. in common, and it's consumerism. Mm -hmm. And it's consuming yeah. landscapes for the photo, and it's consuming. Um, throwing your litter away in it is very rational behaviour in a consumer society where you're just encouraged to buy more stuff. Mm -hmm. So. That's where the cultural changes Thank you. Um, it's great that you're all such loud speakers because Amy's been <laughs> valiantly waiting with the microphone. Is there any Northern Ireland? Yeah, no, exactly. Is there anyone who's not um, who's not said anything yet? The lady there, please. And then we'll we'll, we'll wind up. I just want to make one point about funding. Mm. And there are various initiatives, the Woodland Initiative, which was administered through Forest Service and things like that. The minimum investment you could make into that yourself was about thirteen and a half thousand which is a big stretch for a lot of people. Yes, you get your money back eventually, but not a lot of people would have that up front. I don't, I don't know what this is. What's this? It's a woodland scheme. Woodland scheme, okay. Woodland scheme is planting. It's supposed to be, you can choose. You can choose sort of what your emphasis is. I, for example, want to very much natural larder and have fruit and nut bearing trees. Plenty of hazel, plenty of wild cherry, that sort of thing. But I couldn't raise that amount of money. So there's one field gone. That I would seem useless, which could be by now already being started to produce things. And I think it's not this with the sword idea. The idea of bringing back natural grasslands, a minimum of 20 species, and it could be way, way, way more than that. The nutritional value of that for fodder, for livestock, for the recreational horse owners who love that roughage, they do not want the monoculture. Um, Hayage. It's awful. It's very bad for horses. And that's a big, wealthy market. 
again, it's something that I think a lot of farmers could be persuaded to see the benefits of it with the right push of funding. And it does often come down to money. If you've got a well-producing silage field that is, you're not going to just tear it up and plant some seeds that you've bought at high, at high expense. It's a very difficult step to make. And I think one of the things that actually Rather the carrot and the stick. We talked a lot about sticks and fines and things like that, if you litter or whatever you may be doing, or pollute your waterways, but there needs to be carrots. I think we need a few more carrots, and I think that will speak to Northern Irish society better than a lot of the sticks. Yeah, well, people seem to forget that farming is actually entirely, not entirely, but very largely dependent on public uh, funding already through subsidy schemes of one sort or another. So actually there is quite a significant influence that the interest of the public can have on um, on, on, on agriculture. Actually, this is one of the arguments in the UK for Brexit, was that we could get out of the common agricultural policy and, and start to put money into what they call it, ELMS, environmental land management, which the government so far has still not been able to decide what it even is. So we've got nowhere on that. But I mean, the concept is good, isn't I mean, it? I mean, I think part of the problem with a lot of the agri-environmental schemes is that the measures that are put in place have no monitoring to go with the actual impact that they have. So there's a, a, you know, a big investment in those schemes, but we don't know whether they're actually really benefiting nature. Mm. Um, and that's part of the problem. There's no, you know, for, for, for what could amount to a budget of billions, none of that is kind of going into evaluating how effective those schemes are for the conservation of nature. Mm. How, how do you... Just to finish on, yes. on that, we have had quite a lot of investment in local landowners with leaving a margin and putting in wildflowers which is super, but I take your point completely. They are fit for the southeast of England. It's corn cockle, it's poppy, it's, they, it's not a hoverfly on them, never mind anything yeah. else. And, and I mean, there is a, you know, the multi-species swords aren't a panacea either. You know, there, there, there are management issues in terms of the way you graze them that have to be figured out. And, and it's very different from grazing the grass right down and then taking, moving the cattle onto the next field. Many of the species that make up those swords will not be able to withstand that kind of level of grazing intensity. Yeah. So they have, to be, they have to be browsed as opposed to grazed. And that requires moving the cattle around more frequently. And that... That's an investment in terms of time and effort on the part of the farmer too. So, so. Uh, from a peatland perspective, how do you financially incentivise landholders to, to conserve and restore peat bogs? It's a big question that we're trying to answer at the minute because realistically we're talking about goods and services or, or you know, public money for public goods, that good old term that keeps <laughs> on cropping up at the minute. Um, and we would argue that you know, a lot of people that have, say, a, a, a large hill farm of blanket bog they're providing services if it is in good condition of things like flood mitigation and water filtration and, and carbon sequestration. Um, but it's putting a value on those things, which is very challenging, particularly when it comes to biodiversity, that's even more challenging. I mean, there are strides that are being made in terms of that. that so um, work that was done um, by the RSPB up in the Garen Plateau in Antrim um, has actually showed a measured reduction in the cost of treating the water in the water treatment facility. Um, by blocking drains. Mm. So there, there are some figures, but it's still very, there's the margins of error still quite large. Um, but one of the big things that I think we've, we've seen down south, which has been a real improvement, is, is rather than, as Mark said, th there's very little monitoring when it comes to agri-environment stuff here, um, and they're prescription-based. We largely identify maybe what type of habitat a, a, a landowner has, and then they, we tell them what to do, and then we largely just shove our fingers in our ears and walk away. Um, whereas down south they've started a lot of these projects which are called results based programs where you basically identify what is on a site and you score the quality of the habitat which is on that farm and the better the score you have the more money you get so if you go out and you count a number of negative indicators then you'll lose a certain number of points if you count a number of positive indicators you gain a certain number of points and you can actively improve your score to get more money so there's more of an ongoing incentive to actually... And that's, that's within the, the common agricultural policy. That's within the cap, mm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, we, those, those people that have been managing in a relatively benign way already aren't going to have to do much to kind of get their results-based payments. But those where biodiversity has been eroded over time have a, have a steeper kind of hill to climb in, in that respect. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and just on that, dude, I think the next step then... Farmers were then doing the scoring themselves because there is a, yeah. a, a cost to monitor these habitats. So in the Barn Life Project and the Iron Life Project, 
farmers were then asked to go and score just to see see how they'd get on. Because <laughs> there was a fear that maybe they would over egg it, but they almost penalised themselves because they were afraid of doing it wrong and and then getting a, a financial you know, disincentive. So they actually became really good at, at assessing their own land. So it reduced the cost of monitoring. Mm. So that's that's the ideal model. But that was in a very specific location yeah. with very specific habitats. So. Mm -hmm. But it was All right. Way well, I, th I think we've got to we've got to draw this to an end now. Um, but if we can take a step back, return to the bigger picture, I want to give each of you two minutes to just give us a sort of closing, some thoughts, really, some reflections on the work that you're doing, the, the broader challenge, um, something hopefully optimistic for people to take away, maybe something that um, people can do and focus on. Um, in reverse order, then, are you okay? <laughs> so are you okay to start, Minik? Then you were just talking. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I, I feel fairly positive that we, we can we can play our part in trying to address both the nature and climate crises. Um, it's a case of management we've got to the best of our ability and advocating for management and enhancement of really good sites and then trying to create or restore new property habitats, so that's new woodland, new meadows. And the Herbalize is not a panacea, but it, it actually for me it, it's, it gets you in to a place where you can move from a very improved field to a, a better field and then you can go to a lowland meadow so it's kind of like a, a transition to creating a nice lowland meadow. Um, one of the asks was you know what can people do? The All Island Pollinator Plan I'd like to plug it because it's, it's a fantastic plan which was very much grassroots so it was an All Island plan looking at how people can improve their, their own patch for, for pollinators so be that a window box, a big garden, a number of fields and it's it shows you just what one or two people can do and how that all collectively combines to really good outcomes for, for pollinators. So I'm remaining positive. <laughs> I, I think the, the key thing to recognise is that there's no, there's no single solution to this. It's going to be a mixture of those socially, the individual actions we can take and the way we can educate our kids and our grandchildren. Um, and, and, and just looking out into the room, it, for many of you, it's going to be the, the influence you have on your grandchildren as opposed to, to your, your, your grown children, perhaps. <laughs> um, not given. But, um, but, uh, so I think there, there are things that everybody can do in, in that respect. Um, but, you know, there's the, the, the technologies, the choices we make in how we use them. Um, there are... Uh, the nature-based solutions that are potentially there that, that can act uh, and benefit what we do. You know, the, the part of the challenge is that, that I think that we, we need, um, a, that there needs to be a political will um, to put in place policies that will affect change. And whilst we don't have a functioning executive, that's really hard to, to see how that will happen. Um, Government departments are operating in a vacuum. There's lots and lots of legislation that I think is probably coming down the tubes that, go that the government departments have been working on. We've been involved directly in, in the development of pieces of legislation. And actually, you know, just to give an example, we've been working with DARA um, on uh, marine pro protected areas review and on a, a blue carbon strategy, blue carbon being the carbon in, that you get locked up in the marine environment. And that's brought together the NGO sector, academics, the fishing industry, all sharing their expertise and knowledge to, to input into and inform a piece of legislation before it even goes out for consultation. So that most of the hard work has been done in advance. And I think that's a, that, that was a prime example of, of a really excellent piece of, of, of work that, that, that was sort of a gold, gold standard in, in, in how you might kind of go about co-designing something. Um, but I think businesses also have a really important part to play. And I think in many cases, businesses aren't waiting for government to put policy. Not all businesses, but some of the bigger organisations that have deeper pockets are able to start making changes quickly and, and are doing so um, without waiting for government because they know that there's a big challenge ahead and they need to... Internationally, our national governments are kind of lagging in some respects. So they are, they are pushing ahead to try and tra trailblaze and, and effect change. And they have a big influence on their customer base. And, and, are, and are, they're, they're, it's not a stick, but they can begin to influence change and are doing so, I think. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I, I think I'd agree with Melina. I'm remaining optimistic, um, maybe in the face of adversity. Um, but I mean, I, I'm thinking about the journey that I've gone through in terms of even just looking specifically at restoring peatlands. Whenever I first started doing this kind of work, um, the thought of going and talking to a fairly industrial scale upland sheep farmer and talking about blocking drains and re-wetting um, was terrifying because my assumption would be that they would absolutely chase me off the land. Um, and I'm not going to say that that hasn't happened on one or two occasions, but um, on the whole, on the whole, it's actually largely the perception is starting to change. You know, um, and in many cases, actually, where we feared that we were going to get, you know, outright aggression, we've we've got apathy. You know, people don't really care. They let you tear away, do what you want. And in some occasions, just today, I was up in North Antrim talking to a big sheep farmer who's a member of the Ulster Farmers Union, very active in advocacy and everything. And he is absolutely keen to carry out restoration work on a huge area of blanket bog on his farm. So if those sorts of people are starting to change their perception slightly, then I think there is hope there that on the wider scale, we will start to see significant change. And I think actually going back to some of the questions were asked before um, about getting that shift, I think actually if we can start to get particular individuals or champions within the, the groups that we would largely see as, as working against what we are trying to achieve, that can be really powerful. If we can get somebody that the rest of that cohort sees as being part of their tribe, actively engaging in some of these activities, then that is a massive way in. And I would see that as potentially being a bit of a watershed um, over the next number of years. Thank you. Well, um, I tried to give a pessimistic tone to the evening and I failed. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to leave here tonight feeling resolutely, well, a little bit more optimistic, actually, than, than I came in. And um, that's thanks to all three of you. You've been brilliant speakers and you've got an incredible depth of expertise there and also what I really admire about all three of you is that you're, you're practitioners, you're doers, you're actually there on the ground uh, with the direct experience of, of, of making the kind of changes you talk about. A lot of times I'm talking to people who are very abstract, uh, who, you know, at the sort of academic level or NGOs who don't actually ever get, get their feet wet as it were and um, so that's what I've really appreciated having all three of you and I'd just like to thank you once, thank the panel once again for being here with us tonight. <laughs> That's it. Thanks to the museum here in Downpatrick for the very kind hosting and to the uh, Northern Ireland Museums Council as well for doing this whole tour. And, um, well, I hope you all get home safely and help save the planet. Thank you. <laughs>